friends, we're out here in Promontory Point in Hyde Park's eastern reaches. We've talked a lot about immigrants and new arrivals to the city of Chicago through this series. Hyde Park was the first neighborhood I knew like the back of my hand in Chicago. It's where I came to go to college and graduate school at the University of Chicago, and I stuck around for years afterwards, drawn close by the bookstores, coffee shops, and good conversation. Today on this tour, we'll stop by the Valois Cafeteria, the Hyde Park Art Center, Jackson Park, and a few other stops to talk about how new arrivals and others have transformed Hyde Park over the past century and a half. Friends, if we had been here in the fall of 1893, we'd be standing here surrounded by nearby state pavilions for the World's Columbian Exposition. An Eskimo village, the state building to celebrate Texas's accomplishments, and much more. The two events that define Hyde Park's history in the late 19th century are the World's Columbian Exposition and the creation of the University of Chicago. Certainly today, the University of Chicago endures, and the legacy of the built environment of the Columbian Exposition is another part of this story. Over six months in 1893, over 27 million people came to visit the Columbian Exposition. Almost half of those people came from outside of the United States. They found culture, the introduction of new technologies, conversation about literature, art, music, and more. Of course, not all groups were made to feel welcome at the Columbian Exposition. African Americans and women found themselves largely excluded from most of the events, despite the protestations of Ida B. Wells, Frederick Douglass, and others. Today, when you come to Jackson Park, you can take a look at the Palace of Fine Arts, now the Museum of Science and Industry, wander around the lagoon, and make your way through the rest of the grounds. You will be taking part in an experience that was had by over 25 million visitors to the fair. And certainly many of them took these experiences back to their home cities, their countries of origin, and inspired them to create their own type of cultural exchange and creativity. Next, we're gonna head on over to the Metro Tracks and talk about one of my favorite pieces of public art in Hyde Park. come from, where are we going? Maybe you've asked yourself that question. Maybe you've asked a friend that question. Maybe you've asked that neighbor that question. It's a question posed by this mural by Olivia Goody. In the spring of 1992, Olivia and her assistants asked people as they got off the commuter train this very question. They took the results and created this remarkable mural. As you stop and pause, you'll see conversations about the University of Chicago, traveling from the south to the north side, traveling from the north to the south side, snippets of lines from Plato, and conversations about family. It's one of those pieces of public art that celebrates new arrivals, the process of moving through a city, and the process of becoming and being self-aware. It's one of my favorite pieces of public art in the entire city. And Hyde Park is so fortunate to have it. You'll want to come by and pause, and maybe you'll think about your own story, your own way of becoming, arriving, and being in transition. Friends, next we're going to head over to the Hyde Park Art Center to talk about their remarkable work in the community.
friends, I'm here with Sierra McKissick of the Hyde Park Art Center. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. Hello, welcome. Glad to have you here. Yeah, it's wonderful to be back. Um, for friends who don't know, who may be watching, could you tell us a little bit about the origins of the Hyde Park Art Center and what you all do here? Yeah, the Hyde Park Art Center has been around for 80 years. We actually just celebrated our 80th anniversary last year at our gala. It was born out of the WPA, really to push forward diverse voices and arts artists and audiences and whatnot. And we really have an intergenerational space. We do a lot and offer a lot of different components from education to exhibitions like the one we're in now and also public programs and residencies as well too. So we work with a lot of artists who are emerging and established to help push forward their voices and their platforms through the work that we do here and also cultivating young minds as well too. We also have a robust team program as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And what a, an amazing palette of programs, too. So Yes, most definitely. So we just reopened uh, sort of to the public as well for our exhibition that we're currently having called Artists Run Chicago, featuring 50 artist-run spaces. So it's been nice to engage with people in new ways, but also bring people back to the center in safer ways as well, too. That's fantastic. What's been some of the ways that you have dealt with this challenging time? Yeah, I think that we've had a really supportive staff and team in thinking about how we can move forward and forge forward in an innovative way. So aside from, you know, doing virtual programs and whatnot, we really elevated our education department where we're able to offer online courses for people. And we've tested out the community supported model, something that we've hoped to do in the past, but now we've really been able to implement it and we've been able to bring in new audiences and community members be able to take our courses that may not have been able to before. It kind of releases some of those barriers to entry and increases access points for people to engage with our work here. And we've been continuing to do virtual online programming as well through our monthly Center Sundays, which includes art making activities, conversations and performances, and also um, lots of different engaging activities for people to look at while it's happening but also revisit at a later time when they're available. I love your optimism and I feel uplifted just talking to you about <laughs> all this. Yeah. It's, it's really great. It's been great. We've really been thinking about ways to take some of the things that we've learned in this digital virtual sphere when we come back into the public sphere as well too. So lots of ideas moving forward. The work never stops. We still are here to serve our community as well because we are really a hub for people and we want to exemplify that through our work, even if it's online. That's wonderful. What's one of the events when we are able to uh, uh, gather together in person a bit more? What's something you're looking forward to doing? Something I'm looking forward to, really it was like this exhibition, I think since we've been able to open it, it was supposed to open back in April. It's 50 artist run spaces, so if you can imagine what type of party we would have had for that, mm. it would have been amazing. But we <laughs> did host a small movie screening that was uh, supposed to be outside in our lot, it got rained out. But we were actually able to bring people within the gallery space and have chairs, socially distanced, and watch a film curated by some of the artists who participated in the exhibition. But I think moving forward, we're able to offer appointments to people to come and view the exhibition. So really just talking through that and engaging with them. And some of our school programs are just starting to ramp up for the season. So we're moving slowly, but we're really trying to see what the community needs and feels about how we're operating so that we can take that into account for when we move forward. Wow, that's so exciting, Sierra. And thank you for sharing a little bit of what you and your colleagues have done during these very curious and challenging times. So. Yes, curious and challenging, but definitely insightful and able to uh, learn from these things and take time to truly come together as a staff and team to rethink our future and how we wish we can move forward and see things. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for having us, Sierra. And friends, you'll want to take a look at the Hyde Park Art Center's online presence and hopefully make a visit to come down to Hyde yeah. Park and see them soon. We have programs every Thursday for Artists Run Chicago and exhibition hours as well that people can sign up for on our website. So please do take advantage of that. A lot of hard work has gone into this and we want people to see it. Wonderful, and thank you for your enthusiasm and passion. This has been really wonderful. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. Thank so you, nice Sierra. You. Pleasure. Bye. Friends, next we're gonna head on over to 53rd Street and take a look at one of Chicago's last remaining cafeterias. What's a place that matters to you in your own community? If you ask the number of people in Hyde Park, 
people in other parts of the south side, they'll probably be familiar with the Valois Cafeteria. It's been an institution in Hyde Park for over 80 years. There's a couple things that contribute to its continued success. You have an open seating plan, you have affordable food, and every time you come in, there's someone new to see or talk to. Along with being one of the only remaining cafeterias in the city of Chicago, it's been the subject of countless articles and one very famous book. The book in question is Slim's Table by the sociologist Mitchell Dunier. In his book, he talked about how this place was a place where men, particularly older men, could gather, sit, and converse. As we think about what is important in Chicago and important in Hyde Park, we think of a place like the Valois because it brings together a wide range of people at a variety of times of day. I've been coming to the Valois for over 25 years, and I can't count how many different types of people I've met or seen at the various tables. You'll want to come on down to 53rd Street, find a table, perhaps strike up a conversation. It is one of those great gathering spaces. Friends, how many eggs do you think there are in Chicago? 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million? I'm not going to give you the answer because I have no idea how many eggs are in the city of Chicago. What we are going to do is head down 53rd Street. I'm going to introduce you to the most famous egg in Chicago. <laughs> walk down 53rd Street in Hyde Park, you'll eventually make your way past Nichols Park. As you walk through the park, you'll find a language academy, a playground, and other landscape details that make the place vibrant and most alive. One of my favorite things about Nichols Park, and a favorite of Hyde Parkers since the 1960s, is Cosmo Campbell's Bird of Peace. Now I've referred to it as Chicago's greatest egg, maybe even the world's greatest egg. People come to the space and they find different things in this sculpture. Sure, after a manner of speaking, it is an abstraction, but what will you find in this piece? Every time I come by, I see something a little bit differently. And certainly, so did Cosmo Campoli. He had a high opinion of eggs, and he once said that the egg is nature's most perfect shape. So when you walk by, undoubtedly you will see something new as well. Come by a different time of day. Maybe when the sun set. Maybe when the sun's rising. Maybe it's late afternoon. You will always see something new here. Friends, next we're gonna head on over to the Midway Plaisance and talk a little bit about how that place has been radically transformed over the past 130 years. The first time I ever crossed the Midway Plaisance on foot was making my way to a dining hall at the University of Chicago. It's my first couple of weeks here and I had just started college. I was immediately struck by a couple of things about this very unique landscape. The sheer size, the green swaths. I would later learn that it was a mile long, stretching from Stony Island to Cottage Grove. It continues to fascinate me even as it's fascinated people over the last 130 years. The most famous thing about the Midway Plaisance, it was during the World's Columbian Exposition, a caravan of human villages, extracurricular pursuits that were considered body and aesthetically uninteresting. It was the other side of the Columbian Exposition, not the high-minded neoclassical architecture but the body honky-tonks. When I later learned about this history, I realized why so many people had come and flocked to the section of the fair. It was, after all, a little bit more fun. Of course, today, little remains of that landscape, but the Plaisance is here, a 
place where people can come to gather, whether you're a new arrival or someone who's crossed it hundreds of times. Friends, next we're going to head over to the University of Chicago Quadrangle and talk about how that campus has welcomed new people since 1892. What is the type of institution that brings people, no, takes people thousands of miles away from their home for four, five, or six years? I suppose one answer might be the military. Another answer might be the quest for higher learning, more education, more formal education, if you will. It's the reason I came 2,000 plus miles from Seattle to Chicago over two decades ago to attend the University of Chicago. In fact, we're standing in front of the building here on the University of Chicago campus where I had one of my first classes, a class actually in geomorphology. I can't remember the grade I got, but it was a long time ago. Certainly the University of Chicago is one of those institutions that brings people from thousands of miles away today. They come and study at these collegiate Gothic surrounds they spend time, maybe four years in the college, maybe time in one of the divisions, maybe time in the medical school for some of this learning. Certainly the rich cosmopolitan environment of the University of Chicago welcomes new arrivals. I certainly am reminded of my own experience in college where on my floor we had people from Switzerland, Korea, Canada, and less exotic places close to home like Bolingbrook, Peoria and Quincy, Illinois. It really was a type of cultural melting pot and certainly it's one of those places that I think of when I think of Hyde Park. Next we're going to wander on down 57th Street and talk about a group of literary and cultural new arrivals. What do artists mean to a community? For some folks, it might be a community art class for their children. It might be a neighbor who paints pieces of public art. There are a million more examples. In the late 1890s, an artist colony developed in the buildings that used to be behind me on 57th Street. Constructed in 1891, these 25 tiny little one-story buildings were effectively an informal artist incubator. People like Catherine Dunham, Theodore Dreiser, Thorsten Veblen, and Carl Sandburg spent time in these tiny buildings, most of which were only equipped with a room or two and a small stove. There they were able to make art, write, create sculptures, and even start Chicago's little theater movement. Certainly people like Catherine Dunham and her work with the Cube are an important part of these buildings' history. While the buildings were torn down in 1963, Many of those ideas and those works that they created live with us today. And certainly many Hyde Parkers may not even know that the Hyde Park Art Fair started its life from one of the many small storefronts on 57th Street. Friends, today we've seen a number of things. We've talked a little bit about how the Hyde Park Art Center continues to change the community with its programs and various outreach ideas. We've walked around the point, we've strolled down the Midway Plaisance, and we've even seen the world's greatest egg. It's remarkable to think that one Chicago community contain such multitudes. Hyde Park is fortunate to have all of these things, and hopefully you'll choose to make a trip and see what makes Hyde Park special for you. Friends, after each one of these journeys, I always like to reflect and offer a haiku that I hope captures some of what we've done together and some of the time we've shared. Let's sit 
on the point. Faces below, faces above. Hyde Park, I love you.